Mesdames et Messieurs, bienvenue à Dr. Pierre Côté et à Dr. Jean-Pierre Ruti. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Pierre Côté and Dr. Jean-Pierre Ruti. Uh, merci, merci beaucoup. Uh, hi, everybody. I will be the French part of this, <laughs> the, the, this session. Uh, en fait, je tiens à vous souhaiter la bienvenue à Montréal pour cette, uh, ce 21e congrès canadien de recherche sur le, le VIH SIDA. Après 30 ans de mobilisation des intervenants œuvrant dans différentes disciplines, j'entends les chercheurs fond, euh, de, fondamentaux, les cliniciens, les épidémiologistes, les intervenants en santé publique, les différentes communautés de malades. Donc, je dis après 30 ans de mobilisation, des percées plus que remarquables ont été faites, particulièrement au niveau euh, médical. Grâce à cette mobilisation, une personne qui est nouvellement infectée maintenant par le VIH peut espérer vivre pratiquement aussi longtemps que la population en général si elle a accès au traitement anti-VIH. L'infection par le VIH est maintenant considérée comme une maladie chronique. On sait maintenant que les thérapies peuvent même prévenir l'acquisition ou la transmission du VIH, percée importante. On sait, on sait également que les interventions basées sur la réduction des méfaits sont efficaces et leur place dans la lutte contre le VIH est essentielle. Pourtant, le virus se propage toujours et touche majoritairement ici du moins des populations qui sont plus marginales, souvent stigmatisées et plus vulnérables. Des efforts restent à faire pour maintenir la mobilisation de tous. Le sida n'est pas une maladie comme les autres. Vivre avec le VIH amène des conséquences très importantes. Le VIH n'est pas une maladie noble. Le dévoilement ou non de son, son statut sérologique, par exemple, ouvre la porte à la stigmatisation, au rejet, à l'isolement, voire même à la, à la criminalisation. Le Canada, d'ailleurs, ne fait très piètre figure dans ce domaine. Rien ne motive une personne à connaître son statut sérologique si la, la conséquence de ne pas le dire risque de la rendre criminelle. Pourtant, si cette personne savait qu'elle était porteuse VIH, elle pourrait être traitée, vivre tout aussi longtemps qu'une autre personne non infectée, sans transmettre son virus à l'autre. Un autre défi important est l'accessibilité aux soins, aux services sociaux pour tous. C'est primordial. Les groupes plus vulnérables consultent trop tardivement, dans des conditions souvent plus sévères, plus difficiles à récupérer. Nous devons continuer à développer des stratégies, à chercher, à rejoindre ces populations qui sont plus particulières. Donc, il reste plein de défis à relever, tant au point de vue scientifique qu'au point de vue social et préventif. Sincèrement, j'espère que cette conférence nous aidera à avancer davantage dans la lutte contre le VIH. Voilà, je tiens à remercier tous les membres du comité d'organisation qui, euh, je pense, sont énumérés euh, sur le, euh, le, la diapositive. Je tiens à remercier aussi tous les bénévoles qui travaillent très fort pour la, la, le bon fonctionnement de la conférence. Et finalement, merci à Anjou Majesté, à toute l'équipe euh, de ce site Sky pour tout le travail que la salle de coordination euh, qu'ils ont fait pour, le, pour cette conférence. Merci beaucoup. So, welcome, bienvenue at the 21st annual Canadian conference on HIV AIDS research. This year, we are more than 840 uh, persons who attend this meeting, and we had the most uh, numerous abstract sub submission with 456 abstracts submitted at this car. So this year in Montreal, we break some record from the quality and quantity of uh, abstracts submitted, and also we are facing a turning point, and that's the theme of this meeting, a turning point in the fight against HIV. We are meeting new challenge, and we have, and we recognized to define a momentum in this epidemic. Indeed, for the first time, we have started to curve the HIV epidemic, representing a turning point in the global HIV response in controlling the infection. 
only one person has been cured to date by stem cell transplants that paves the road for alternative strategy for eradication and making this strategy a priority. We uh, have also this year the most numerous ancillary meeting ever in the era of uh, CAR with uh, 12 meetings starting from yesterday until Monday uh, and that's covering all the topic of the HIV fight in Canada and also in thousands of countries. Also, after uh, the meeting and uh, exchanging data and uh, fostering interaction among participants, we will have a very nice uh, evening, a gala party, une soirée. It will be very, very close. You just have to cross the street, and it's a, a marvelous place on the 47th floor of the next uh, door building, and you have a view on Montreal by night, and you will have uh, free access to music, dancing, and alcohol. And you don't need to drive, you just need to cross carefully the street to go back to the hotel. So that will be a venue, and this uh, gala has been selected by Dr. Pierre Coté, my co-chair, and uh, sincerely will be a marvelous event on top of the quality of the scientific exchange. So what's next? So now uh, we have to uh, welcome Dr. Jonathan Angel, who is the president of CAR, to uh, present uh, the Mark Weinberg conference speaker. Dr. Angel. So um, before I get to the Mark Weinberg speaker, I'm um, providing some opening remarks. And first, I'd like to thank Jean-Pierre and Pierre uh, and the entire organizing committee on the outstanding program uh, this year. Jean-Pierre has uh, described a little about what's up ahead, and there's a lot, uh, uh, a lot over the next uh, couple of days for, for everybody. Uh, as the president, it's a great honor to take part in the official opening of the 21st annual uh, Canadian Conference on HIV AIDS Research. Um, for, first, I'd like to take this opportunity to recognize the members of CAR Council who are probably scattered amongst you for their hard work and uh, uh, volunteer commitment over the last year in setting CAR's direction. Uh, and just wave, you don't have to stand up, but wave if, you, if I mention your name. So uh, Bob Hogg, who's the president-elect, uh, Bill Cameron, who everybody knows and loves, uh, particularly me, <laughs> Curtis Cooper, uh, Matthias Gotta, uh, Jean-Pierre Ruti, uh, Peggy Milson, uh, Sarah Green, Carol Strike, and Darian Taylor. And, uh, you know, I, I, um, I was provided with speaking notes, and I'm very grateful for that. And the only reason that a lot of this has come together and I actually have speaking notes is because of the hard work of our executive director. Um, uh, I think our former executive director did a great job in setting the stage. And I don't know if Bob O'Neill is here, but I think I'd like to recognize Bob O'Neill. I think he left the organization between annual conferences, but he did an outstanding job as the executive director. And... Um, uh, um, took an organization or, or transferred an organization in good hands to uh, Andrew Matejic, who's our current executive director, who's really uh, been outstanding. And I personally can can speak to that. I'm sure the, those involved in the conference organizing, the conference organizing committee, can um, uh, tell you what a great job uh, Andrew has done um, as executive director. His name's nowhere in the speaking notes because he's modest and he wrote these. But but um, I was not going to let this opportunity go by to not uh, thank him. He doesn't believe it when I do it in person, so I thought I'd do it in public. <laughs> so the annual CAR conference is the premier gathering in Canada for those working in all disciplines of, in all disciplines of HIV and AIDS research, uh, as well as policymakers, persons living with HIV, and other individuals committed to ending the epidemic. It is a chance to assess where we are, evaluate recent scientific developments and lessons learned, and together chart a course forward. Uh, 
We can be proud that Canadian researchers remain at the forefront of HIV research, focusing on all aspects of the disease, from exploring the basic foundation of the disease, understanding the intersection of aging and complications of HIV AIDS, improving care and treatment, to developing interventions to reduce the risks and rates of complications. Once again, this year's program will present, present new scientific knowledge and offer many opportunities for a structured dialogue on the major issues facing the global response to HIV. A variety of sessions from abstract-driven presentations to symposia, bridging and plenary sessions will meet the needs of various participants. Other related activities, including ancillary meetings and the new investigator workshop, will contribute to an exceptional opportunity for professional development and networking. Uh, CAR 2012 will be a tremendous opportunity for researchers and community members from coast to coast to share the latest scientific advances in the field, learn from one, an one another's expertise, and develop new ways to treat and prevent HIV. I hope you enjoy the conference, find it to be a worthwhile learning experience, and thank you in advance for your contributions, participation, and support. Um, th that's it for my opening remarks, and now I'd like to take the opportunity to introduce our first uh, dignitary. Um, the, the, uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Mark Ouellette, who I've gotten to know quite well over the past year or two, is a scientist who you should all get to know. He's a scientific director of the CHR Institute of Infection and Immunity, a Tier 1 Canada Research Chair in Antimicrobial Resistance and Professor of Microbiology at the University of Laval. In his role at the CHR, Mark is responsible for the $22.7 uh, uh, million dollar research envelope, that's why everyone should get to know him, uh, provided by the federal initiative to address HIV and AIDS in Canada. Mark. That's not really the only reason why you should get to know him, it's one. <laughs> Thank you, Jonathan. So it is a great pleasure indeed to be here uh, with you this evening to help celebrate successes in HIV research. Uh, I thank the organizing committee for giving me the opportunity to speak with you. Uh, it's also very nice to see Andrew. Uh, I mean, I, I've started my HIV file working with you, and now I, I see all the great work that you're doing uh, on behalf of CAR. Uh, since becoming scientific director of the Institute of Infection and Immunity, I have been impressed by the quality, the quantity, and especially the diversity of uh, HIV research that are being led by Canadians. Les IRSC, les Instituts des maladies infectieuses et immunitaires, sont fiers d'interagir avec des chercheurs aussi mobilisés, impliqués et talentueux. Jonathan, through the federal initiative, HIV indeed has a, a dedicated budget of $22.7 million. This budget remains strong despite the overall fiscal constraints across the federal government, and we are certainly thankful to the Government of Canada for the continuous support. The HIV research community is strong and vibrant and are also highly successful in their regular CIHR open competitions, and overall funding to HIV research reached in 2010-2011, over $45 million. So this funding continues to support research and build capacity for the next generation of HIV researchers in Canada. En parlant de la nouvelle génération des chercheurs, j'ai eu le privilège de rencontrer plusieurs d'entre eux au Forum des nouveaux chercheurs que l'Institut a tenu récemment au Lac de l'Âge, en banlieue de Québec, et j'ai pu constater la vitalité de la future génération des chercheurs dans le domaine du HIV-SIDA. This year, CIHR was pleased to recognize at its award night. So uh, every year we have an award night, and uh, the work of Kate Shannon uh, was the recipient of the Peter Lockheed CIHR New Investigator Award for her work on the relation between criminalization of prostitution and vulnerability to HIV infection. Through the Canadian HIV Vaccine Initiative, we recently announced funding five teams of Canadian and lower and middle income countries on vaccine discovery and social research team. This partnership with the Canadian International Development Agency for, uh, in English, the acronym would be SIDA, which is like a, the French acronym of uh, AIDS. So, uh, so they, were, they were very nice and it brought 17 million to strengthen links between Canadian and LMIC researchers. Nous souhaitons la meilleure des chances aux professeurs Rosenthal, Weinberg, uh, Brockman, Newman et Otrosky et à leur équipe. 
the HIV team in collaboration with the Government of Canada, including our long-term collaborator from the Public Health Agency of Canada, and Chris Archibald is here today, including uh, are working on additional funding opportunities on the vaccine front through the Canadian HIV Vaccine Initiative, and this will be done through the help of the Alliance Coordinating Office that uh, Greg Ammon will talk about a little bit later. So please stay tuned to hear about other funding opportunity in this field. So the HIV AIDS Research Initiative team has a boot here at the meeting, and please stop by and engage into discussion with the CIHR staff. We're here to help you, to help the research community and the community itself. And I'll, I would like to take the advantage that you give me this stage, Andrew. I couldn't do it when you were wor working uh, for us, but to highlight the fantastic work of the team, uh, of the HIV team at the CIHR, in particular of Jennifer Gunning and Paula Curtin, that are the heart and soul of the CIHR-led HIV initiative. So I wish you the best for this meeting, learning, sharing, networking, and going, going back home with new ideas on how to continue to diminish the burden of HIV. I had to prepare my speaking notes, so I don't know who's next. Uh, it's Dr. Greg Ammon, or, or no, Jean-Pierre Routier, okay, thank you. So thank you to Dr. Marc Wallet, and there is a link with the next talk, and um, it's my honor and pleasure to introduce uh, Greg Hammond, director of the Alliance Coordinating Office, also focusing on uh, HIV vaccines. So, Greg. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. It's my pleasure on behalf of the Alliance Coordinating Office to describe today some features of the Canadian HIV Research Initiative, Research and Develop an Alliance. And from here on, I'm going to use the word alliance so that it's not such a much, so, so much of a mouthful. Um, I hope to describe to you the direction of the alliance in terms of some of the collaborative research that we intend going forward. Now, I have a button to push here. It actually works. So um, just to start off and give you an overview, the Canadian HIV, research, uh, Canadian HIV Vaccine Initiative began in February of 2007. And uh, this has been started to contribute to the world's initiative for HIV vaccine prevention. In 2010, uh, Prime Minister Harper and Bill Gates announced an extension of this initiative with a renewed funding of $139 million until 2017. So the alliance is the cornerstone of this renewed CHVI. The co-chairs for this were announced in 2010, Baggy Singh and Jose Esparza, and a consultation report was released in the fall of 2010 that engaged many of you in the consultation effort to understand what the alliance should do to help promote Canadian HIV uh, vaccine work. Uh, as a result of that report, the alliance coordinating office uh, was a competitive process that was set up and it was actually formally established in writing November 10th of 2011. Now the Alliance funding partners are the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and three departments of the federal government. The Department of Health, which is the lead, Industry Canada, and uh, International uh, Relations. So the uh, three departments actually are represented by five agencies and or departments uh, the three ministries are represented by five departments and agencies, and these include CIHR, CEDA, Health Canada, Industry Canada, and the Public Health Agency of Canada, which is the overall coordinating lead within the federal government. So the alliance, uh, this terminology is shown in the schematic. It's actually intended to be a network, and it brings together leading researchers from public, private, and the international sectors to work with communities to develop innovative solutions to challenges facing HIV vaccine development. And this schematic shows the various partners with the Alliance Advisory Board in the center. Again, the, uh, the funding partners have representation on the Alliance Advisory Board, as well as the Alliance Coordinating Office. So the vision for the Alliance is an integrated network of researchers who collaborate on high impact program areas, capitalizing on Canada's strengths, creating new opportunities for international collaboration and ensure that Canada is a leading contributor to global HIV vaccine research. The Alliance Coordinating Office supports both the um, 
the board and the alliance itself. And regarding supporting the alliance, one of the areas of support is to support future directions. There are three major factors that are shaping the directions of alliance research uh, for HIV vaccines, and that is the international perspective of what is needed. This is a slide compiled by the Gates Foundation a year ago looking at the vaccine pipeline. And it shows that in phase one trials, there are approximately 40 vaccine candidates, and that number drops off rapidly as you get into later clinical trials. This pipeline takes time, they're very expensive studies, and they require a lot of preparation. So on an international level, we're finding that Canada could be a contributor to HIV vaccine clinical trials development in, for example, developing countries where the clinical trials would likely need to occur to develop and prove efficacy and effectiveness of these vaccines. So for example, there's an upcoming P5, uh, the pox virus protein public-private partnership initiative, which will likely go ahead in 2015 in South Africa. So Canada could be preparing for activity in that regard. Another strategic driver for future direction will be the funders and the funding envelopes and the programmatic areas for which they think are priorities. Across the top of the schematic, we see the partners in the departments of uh, federal government, as well as Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. We can see the amounts of money that they've allocated to either advancing basic science, translating research into clinical trials, or addressing enabling conditions. The total was $142 million, but because this happened in 2010, a uh, fair amount of the money has already been, either been spent or designated or allocated. So there are, are approximately $44 million in undesignated, unspent funds, and a large portion of that is with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So we need to work with them and understand what their priorities are moving forward so that we can uh, unlock some of these funds in the themes that are assigned here. That's one example. So the Alliance Coordinating Office priorities over the next six months, I wanted to highlight two on this list. One, one of these two is the completion of a draft white paper, April of 2012. This white paper will help set strategic direction for the Alliance. The other opportunity here was to get feedback on this white paper at the CAR meeting, and we've done that this morning. We had a workshop session. About 35 of you participated in that. Uh, it was facilitated by SHI Consulting and we had some very valuable feedback. We have a short time frame, however, to continue this process. We have to go back to our board by June. There's already been consultation over the past couple of years, and we're trying to move this whole process forward to give focus to the Alliance initiative. So the Alliance Coordinating Office will be providing support to this process through communications and awareness building, through translation, commercialization, and industry outreach, by brokering collaboration among many of you who are stakeholders and researchers, by trying to develop young and early career talent and building on some of your efforts that have already been started, and overall trying to champion and enable Canada's contribution on the global stage. So as a result of this morning's workshop, these were the four priority areas that were thought to be um, worthwhile by the process conducted by SHI Consulting where they looked globally and they also had feedback from many Canadians. And so these four are just briefly harnessing Canada's excellence in basic science and strengthening linkages with clinical research, social science, and community, amplifying Canada's strengths in clinical research, community engagement, and capacity building globally and nationally, accelerating the translation of Canada's scientific discoveries, and lastly, strengthening and enabling young and early career investigators. So these were the four priority areas. And uh, we did change some of the wording as a result of the feedback we obtained this morning. So this will be part of the white paper going forward. So this is our AACO team. It's a small team. Uh, lady in the center at the back is uh, the CEO of the ICID group where we're housed. Uh, Heather and the other four team members uh, from left to right are here. Uh, Alan Ronald is at the back with myself. So we have... Uh, uh, Tanya, uh, Wendy, Renee, Ellen, and myself at the back. Uh, we're all here, five of us. Uh, we're mostly part-time people. We're engaged in this process. We look forward to meeting with you and collaborating with you. We have a booth here, and we look forward to your feedback and interactions. You can also find us online. Uh, today was a kickoff of our website. 
we'll be posting the white paper there and we'll be very anxious and interested in getting your feedback on this white paper which will help set the strategic direction for the Alliance. Uh, we have approximately a uh, two to three week window so we're looking for feedback by mid-May and then we will be taking it further forward to our advisory board. So this is an ongoing process which is just starting and we look forward to your involvement in both this white paper process and to working with the Alliance. So thank you very much for this time. So thank you for, to Dr. Hamon for this very encouraging uh, perspective. Et maintenant, uh, j'appelle Dr. André Dontini, directeur du développement des individus et de l'environnement social, ministère de la Santé et des Services Sociaux. Bonjour à tous. Alors, euh, vous allez peut-être vous poser la question, un directeur de développement des individus de l'environnement social, que fait-il ici? Au fait, je suis à la Direction générale de santé publique et, entre autres, responsable du volet du, de la lutte contre les infections transmissibles sexuellement et par le sang au Québec. Alors, euh, premièrement, euh, cher président, co-président, donc Dr. Angel, Dr. Routy, Dr. Côté, euh, merci euh, de, de, de me permettre de prendre ces quelques minutes pour y aller de ce mot de bienvenue. Euh, merci d'être présent à Montréal. Depuis 1991, je comprends qu'il y a eu six euh, congrès de l'Association canadienne euh, de recherche sur le VIH euh, qui s'est tenu euh, ici à Montréal, deux autres au Québec. Donc, euh, je pense qu'on est dans un de ces lieux de prédilection. En tant que directeur de santé publique, je suis heureux de savoir aussi que samedi soir, vous serez dans des conditions où vous allez pouvoir prendre l'alcool avec une certaine préoccupation de sécurité. Ça fait que tant mieux. Mais surtout, profitez des prochains jours euh, pour pouvoir être en mesure de, de, de profiter justement de ces euh, travaux de recherche qui se, mènent, euh, euh, qui se mènent présentement au Québec et au euh, Canada. Donc, euh, euh, le thème de la conférence, un point tournant de lutte contre de, le VIH, de nouveaux défis à relever, nous rappelle que, donc, depuis 30 ans, depuis près de 30 ans, avec la découverte du VIH, avec près de 15 ans d'utilisation de thérapie euh, euh, antirétrovirale hautement active, euh, on estime qu'on est présentement à un point tournant où il est possible d'envisager sur le plan international, bien entendu, comme il a été soulevé jusqu'à maintenant, euh, avec les investissements requis, mais compte tenu des études, des recherches qui ont été faites, si on peut mettre en place, si on peut renforcer l'ensemble des activités de prévention et de traitement que l'on connaît aujourd'hui, euh, nous sommes dans la situation où il est possible de briser la chaîne de transmission, de pouvoir euh, voir l'avenir avec beaucoup plus d'optimisme euh, que nous pouvions le voir euh, ces, euh, ces dernières années. Euh, en 2005, le docteur Philippe Couillard, alors ministre de la Santé, euh, disait euh, lors du Congrès à Québec dans un mot d'ouverture que depuis plus de décennies, les chercheurs canadiens et québécois spécialistes des sciences fondamentales, des sciences cliniques, de la santé publique, des sciences sociales et de la recherche en milieu communautaire se sont distingués pour leur dévouement, leurs idées d'avant-garde, un désir sincère de vaincre euh, cette infection. Euh, je pense que vous vous reconnaissez toujours là-dedans, euh, la préoccupation de pouvoir être en mesure euh, de renforcer le plus possible les recherches qui seront utiles à la prise de décision, qui seront utiles au renforcement des actions cliniques, euh, utiles aux actions de prévention. Mais c'est dans cette perspective-là que vous allez avoir l'occasion d'échanger dans, euh, dans les prochains jours. Euh, euh, J'aimerais euh, terminer en disant que les résultats de recherche donc en matière de VIH dans l'ensemble des champs que je viens de nommer peuvent et doivent alimenter les politiques et les pratiques tant en santé publique euh, que euh, dans le domaine clinique. Et donc, euh, c'est dans ce contexte-là que je vous souhaite ces échanges les plus fructueux euh, dans les prochaines journées. Euh, merci de profiter de ce séjour dans cette euh, merveilleuse ville de Montréal. Bonne session à tous. Alors, merci au docteur André Dantini. Et maintenant, j'invite docteur Chris Archibald, directeur of the Surveillance and Epidemiology Division, Center for Communicable Diseases and Infection Control, Public Health Agency of Canada. Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Ruti. And good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, bonsoir. It's my pleasure to be here with you tonight on behalf of the Public Health Agency of Canada 
and in particular Dr. Howard New, Director, of the, uh, Director General of the Center for Communicable Diseases and Infection Control. Unfortunately, Dr. New could not be with us here uh, in person for these opening ceremonies. I would like to take a moment to acknowledge the efforts of the conference's organizing committee for uh, once again making this conference such an important opportunity for researchers from academia, community, and the public and private sectors to come together to share their experiences and knowledge. J'aimerais également souligner la, la diversité de la recherche qui sera présentée à cette conférence. De la recherche scientifique, scientifique de base à la recherche clinique, en passant par la recherche épidémiologique, la recherche sur les comportements sociaux et la recherche en matière de prévention. Votre travail contribue directement à la recherche sur le VIH et la prévention au Canada et internationalement. Nous avons plusieurs raisons de célébrer nos réussites et nos contributions dans le domaine. I understand that many of you are interested to know whether Budget 2012 affected HIV-AIDS funding. The 2012 federal budget outlined a series of funding reductions in government departments to reduce the government's deficit. The Public Health Agency of Canada was asked to contribute to this exercise and will be achieving savings of $68 million by the fiscal year 2014-15, or approximately 12% of our total budget. This government-wide spending review provided impetus for the agency to identify areas where we can focus better on the federal role in public health and to maximize efficiencies. However, the Government of Canada remains committed to a long-term comprehensive approach to addressing HIV and AIDS, both in Canada and around the world. And in that context, the government will continue to invest over 72 million in this fiscal year into the federal initiative to address HIV AIDS in Canada. We will continue to carry out our key activities, including research, support for program implementation, surveillance, laboratory activities, and the development of public health guidelines. The Government of Canada will invest over 45 million into HIV AIDS community-related programs over the next two years. Nonetheless, the budget for 2012 will result in some changes to the way we conduct our business. We will be exploring new ways to deliver programs that are both effective and efficient in meeting the needs of those who are infected with and affected by HIV and AIDS. As an example, our agency will consolidate the HIV AIDS and Hepatitis C grants and contributions programs to eliminate the potential duplication of work for community organizations. And this consolidation is aligned with the Center for Communicable Disease and Infec Infection Control's transition that was announced last summer. Through this transition, our center's organization has shifted from a more disease-specific approach to a structure that predominantly is function-based in order to better address infectious diseases in a coordinated and integrated manner. As well, the federal budget for 2012 will impact a number of our operational activities and will result in some changes in certain areas, such as the frequency and format of meetings. And we will also be using um, more newer technologies to reduce costs, in particular associated with the work usually done through meetings. And moving forward, the Government of Canada will continue to support the world-class HIV and AIDS research done through the Canadian Institutes of Health Research and supported by that group. And the partnership of the Public Health Agency of Canada with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation through the Canadian HIV Vaccine Initiative will continue to invest the $139 million mentioned before for accelerating the development of a safe and effective HIV vaccine. And at the heart of this partnership lies the CHVI Research and Development Alliance, as you've heard uh, from Dr. Hammond. The Canadian Association for HIV Research helps to contribute to the Alliance's goal by successfully bringing together leading Canadian researchers to share the results of their work and to learn from each other. And this is one of the reasons that our public health agency has recently approved funding for the direct support of CAR conferences. Over the past several years, federal government funding has been used by CAR to support planning for the conference, for scholarships to allow young researchers to participate and attend in the conference, and for new investigator awards. CAR has been instrumental in advancing the fight against HIV and AIDS. And as captured in the theme of this year's conference, we are indeed at a turning point related to our advances in HIV research. However, 
30 years into the HIV and AIDS response, a number of important questions remain. Similar to other developed countries, we are still wrestling with how to significantly reduce HIV incidence. A stronger focus on intervention research will help build the evidence base to improve HIV prevention among key populations. We also need to translate research evidence so that it is more accessible and useful to frontline organizations. And there goes some of the water. There's a lot of water up here. So. <laughs> I guess there's limited table space because it's all on the podium. <laughs> Other questions are, of course, people living with HIV are looking for simpler and more effective treatments. And of course, there is still no HIV vaccine, although there are recent promising developments in this area. There are knowledge gaps that remain, no doubt, but there is also new research that is filling some of these gaps, and we will see examples of both during the course of the next few days. I look forward to the research findings that will be shared at this conference and to discussing them with you. The main message I want to leave you with this evening on behalf of Dr. New is that the Public Health Agency of Canada is committed to continuing to work with Canadian HIV and AIDS researchers so that together we can address this important public health challenge. And see you. Merci beaucoup. So thank you to Dr. Archibald, and now it's time to uh, congratulate the community uh, scholarship recipient, and I just want them to stand up, de, de se lever à leur nom, donc Denise Baker, Donald Caro, Mike Cecilio, Joanne Linsday, Therese Richet, Eric Ross, Marguerite Sanchez, Lynn Thompson, Floyd Weiser, and Fessa Vorden Mariam. So please stand up and let's uh, <laughs> applause. So congratulations. And now we have also the academic uh, scholarship from uh, CAR 2012, and I will uh, invite them to come at the bottom of the stair. So first, uh, uh, Tristan Markle from uh, Simon Fraser University, please uh, come uh, close to us. Uh, Raymond Wong from University of Toronto. Carlos Melendez Pena from McGill. Deanna Zanet from British Columbia University, Ariel Nesbitt from the same university in British Columbia and Center for Excellence in HIV AIDS, Shitan Patel from University of British Columbia. And uh, I invite uh, Dr. Angel and Pierre Cote for, to have uh, a photo, but we should have the full group. So, where are we? are only three. So, please don't be shy. <laughs> Just a photo. I'm good, I'm good. Um, so I, I, I also have the pleasure of introducing some award awardees. I'd like to introduce the 2011 CAR CIHR doctoral, student, doctoral Scholarships in HIV Research. Each of these uh, recipients chosen via peer review process will receive up to $35,000 $35, in annual support for their doctoral training. Um, and I'm not going to make you come to the front, but I'd like each of you to stand up. Uh, Rodney King from UBC in social science category. Is Rodney King here? No. <laughs> Catherine Muldoon, also from UBC in epidemiology. 
Brandon Osborne from U of T in Clinical Sciences. Very good. And Peter Kwashi from the Jewish General Hospital in Montreal of Basic Sciences. So congratulations to uh, all of you. So although the researchers, as we know, are the real heart of this conference, this conference couldn't happen without the uh, support of its uh, sponsors, who have been very, continued to be very generous uh, um, over the years, and particularly this year. And so we'd like to uh, recognize uh, all of them. I think I've got the teleprompter to help me, and their names should be on the screen in very big print so you can see them. So the platinum sp sponsors are Bristol Myers Squibb Canada, Gilead, Merck, Vive, and uh, I need to mention that Bristol Myers Squibb and Vive Health will also be supporting a CAR uh, supported uh, studentship that will be announced at CAR 2013. So we owe a lot to the, these um, uh, companies, both for their support of the meeting itself, but also for the, the uh, support of trainees. Uh, thank you. Uh, Abbott, the Government of Canada, all aspects of the Government of Canada. <laughs> Janssen, CAHR, of course. Holy mackerel. And the, the remaining supporters. <laughs> leave, leave, please leave that slide up. Um, so now I have the, the pleasure of introducing the Mark Weinberg Lecture. Um, the, the CAR Conference Organized Committee d bestows the honor of the Mark Weinberg Lecturer to both honor uh, Dr. Weinberg's ongoing contributions and to recognize the efforts of uh, others in the research community who exemplify the same traits of excellence, perseverance, and commitment to the cause of finding innovative and groundbreaking ways to addressing the epidemic. Before introducing this year's uh, Mark Weinberg lecturer. We like to give uh, Mark Weinberg the opportunity to say a, a few words. He's usually given a minute, but he's negotiated 90 seconds. So I want to keep his personal introduction sh keep his personal introduction short. So M Mark is arguably the most accomplished and most well recognized HIV researcher in Canada. Period. Um, uh, that's it. That's it. M most. Most. <laughs> Um, most, recent, most recently, uh, he's in, in innumerable awards and accomplishments, but most recently he was awarded the 2012 Killam Prize in Health Sciences and honored by uh, Air Canada as a, a super elite member, in the, the first in a series of honored, of honored members. That's, a, that's quite the accomplishment, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> so with that brief uh, introduction, you need no more introduction, please come up. Bonsoir, mesdames et messieurs. Euh, merci beaucoup. Euh, comme je vous ai dit euh, très souvent, c'est une grande honneur euh, pour moi, évidemment, que le conseil de notre association a pris la décision de m'honorer avec cette conférence qui sera donnée bientôt euh, par une grande amie à moi, professeur Ken Rosenthal. Je crois que je dois répéter quelque chose que j'ai dit assez souvent. Uh, welcome to another in the series of Mark Weinberg pre-memorial lectures. <laughs> now, um, I have to tell you that since the inception of this series, uh, several of the people who have given this lecture um, have told me that it would actually be far more prestigious and look much better on their CVs um, if it were actually the Mark Weinberg Memorial Lecture uh, as opposed to pre-memorial. And um, I, I will someday, I, I'm sure, uh, oblige them. Uh, <laughs> but not yet. Um, I want to um, state that our lab continues 
to remain active, as Jonathan said, and, and as I approach my 90th birthday, um, I am grateful to all of the members of my laboratory for their own very hard work over many years. I want to single out three people in particular um, who have been with us for very long periods of time. Bonnie Spira, who's just passed 30 years in our group. Bluma Brenner, uh, who is approaching 30 years and Cesar Colossos, who has just passed 25 years. And I understand, as Jonathan Angel pointed out, um, how difficult it can sometimes be to work with someone like me, who has an exhausting travel schedule and who counts on people back home uh, to man the fort and, and make sure that things don't get out of hand. I want to uh, end by drawing an analogy uh, to something that gave us all a great deal of pride. Just um, a short while ago at the Olympic Games that were held in Vancouver, um, we really did great, and there was a momentous effort given toward something that was called Own the Podium. Does everyone remember that? Own the Podium. Posséder le podium. Ça veut dire que nous avons encouragé, effectivement, les meilleurs pour faire de leur mieux et pour gagner des médailles d'or. I think we have to do something similar in medical research. We have to persuade all levels of government and decision makers that we need to have the equivalent of an own the podium program in medical research. And I think, having said that, I'll now turn the podium back to Jonathan Angel. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, mesdames et messieurs. That's great. Thanks, Mark. So it now gives me a great privilege to introduce this year's uh, Mark Weinberg lecturer. That's Ken Rosen, Dr. Ken Rosenthal. And I'll say a few words about you, Kate. Ken. Um, there's Ken. Ken's a former. <laughs> Former uh, um, president of CAR and Miss CAR 2001. For those that you, for those of you d that don't, uh, that don't remember, um, and and I was reminded actually there was it was during Car um, Ken's presidency, probably before that photo was taken, that the that the Mark Weinberg uh, um, lectureship as well as the Red Ribbon Award were actually created. So Mark is, you know, has had a, um, rather Ken has had a major role in the, in the, the um, development of CAR and the development of, of important uh, awards that CAR, uh, CAR bestows on folks. So the CAR, the, um, uh, Ken Rousseau, this a little bit about Ken, and getting most of you will probably know Ken as well, but I think I'll um, make sure everybody knows Ken. Uh, uh, Ken received his Bachelor of Science degree at the University of Illinois in 1972 and his PhD at McMaster in 1978. He continues to call McMaster his academic home where uh, um, uh, he's based at the McMaster Immunology Research Center and Michael G. DeGroote Institute for Infectious Disease Research. His research is focused on understanding the role of innate and adaptive mucosal immunity against chronic viral infections and development of safe and effective mucosal vaccines and therapeutics to protect against mucosally or sexually transmitted viruses, including herpes uh, um, uh, simplex virus and HIV. As part of his Bill and Melinda Gates supported grand challenges in global health study, his team has found that resistant HIV infection in a cohort of highly exposed resistant sex workers in Nairobi is due in part to marked alterations in innate sensing. These studies have important implications for HIV vaccine development. Accordingly, his talk today is entitled The Riddle of the HIV Resistant Sex, Wor of HIV -resistant sex Workers, Critical Role of Innate Mucosal Immunity. Ken. So I sh should also, just before, I should also point out the mar just to put kind of things in perspective, uh, Dr. Wallet had mentioned that the large team grants were recently funded for vaccines, and Mark Weinberg, if you missed it, Mark Weinberg, who was here, was a recipient of one of those uh, large team grants, and Ken Rosenthal was also a recipient one of one of those. So that, so uh, just that you're all, I'm very well aware of that, but just so everyone's aware of their accomplishments in this area. So, Ken, please come on up. Well, thank you, Jonathan, uh, and uh, thanks uh, for reminding everyone of my, uh, my female impersonator uh, days. Um, 
It gives me great pleasure and it's an honor to uh, have this opportunity to, uh, to speak to you tonight about uh, some of our research. As Jonathan said, um, the title of our research uh, talk tonight is The Riddle of the HIV Resistant Sex Workers. And what I want to, uh, to tell you about uh, essentially tonight is um, looking at innate immunity. And just to remind everyone, late last year, the Nobel Prizes in Medicine were given, uh, and it, they were awarded to uh, Dr. Bruce Beutler and Jules Hoffman and Dr. Ralf Steinman. And the, the award actually was given half and half. So Dr. Beutler and Dr. Hoffman were awarded the Nobel Prize for their discoveries concerning the activation of innate immunity. And Dr. Ralph Steinman was given the other half award for his discovery of the dendritic cell and the role dendritic cells essentially play in transmitting innate responses to adaptive immune responses. I just want to remind everyone that Dr. Steinman actually hails from Montreal. He grew up in Montreal. Um, I had the great pleasure of knowing both Dr. Steinman and uh, getting to meet Bruce Beutler at McMaster, but I knew Ralph Steinman for uh, many years. He served as the scientific, uh, the head of our scientific advisory board of CANVAC when the Canadian vaccine effort was underway. And he uh, was a very generous guy uh, with his time, with his knowledge. And just so people know, uh, unfortunately, he passed away two days prior to the announcement of the award. And fortunately, the Nobel Committee uh, did follow through and gave the award to uh, his family. So maybe with that opening, um, we will be talking about innate immunity. And this subject has had a tremendous amount of advancements and growth over the past dozen years or so. And the role of innate immunity in HIV, I, what, I, uh, what I'm hoping to speak to you tonight is, is, I think you'll see, fairly important. So HIV is primarily globally a sexually transmitted disease. We now know that, in fact, a swarm of viruses can be deposited on the genital mucosa, but it now appears that the vast majority of infections are initiated by a single clone of transmitter founder envelope bearing viruses. So there's a bottleneck in transmission. Many of the HIV viruses uh, don't get across that barrier, and usually the infection is initiated by a single virus. This is actually the battleground for us because successful vaccines or therapeutics will have to stop the virus from crossing the mucosal barriers. We also know that initial HIV infection, primary infection or acute infection, that HIV not only is just a mucosally or sexually transmitted infection, but the virus rapidly targets and rapidly destroys the activated CD4 positive, CCR5 positive T cells that are primarily found in our mucosal membranes, particularly in the gut, the lungs, and the genital tract. Why is this? Because the vast majority of infections that enter our bodies actually enter through contaminated air that we breathe, through contaminated food or water that we eat or drink, or they're sexually transmitted. And we now know that no matter how HIV infects people, regardless of its route of transmission, the virus rapidly targets and dramatically de depletes the CD4 cells in the mucosa. And this occurs within weeks following initial infection and the virus establishes uh, reservoirs of latency to hand, uh, uh, hang out, if you will, in mucosal-associated lymphoid tissues. Now, what's our current view of HIV pathogenesis? Our current view is, if you see the purple uh, line, the mucosal CD4 cells are wiped out very dramatically within the first 
weeks of infection. And this isn't reflected in the older view of the very slow decline in CD4 cells in the peripheral blood. Why is that? Because only 2% of our white blood cells circulate in the peripheral blood at any given moment in time. The vast majority of our lymphocytes are in our tissues and the vast majority poised at the mucous membranes where these uh, pathogens uh, lie. Now the other important uh, thing on this slide is the red line that says immune activation because we now know that HIV pathogenesis is driven by the activation of the immune system. And this has led to the immune activation hypothesis, essentially that during HIV infection, a state of chronic generalized immune activation is a key determinant of CD4 T cell depletion and progression to AIDS. Um, in support of this hypothesis, immune activation turns out to be a strong independent predictor of clinical disease progression to AIDS that reduction of immune activation may predict CD4 T cell increases after antiretroviral therapy better than virus suppression, and importantly, non-pathogenic simian or monkey immunodeficiency virus infections of natural hosts is associated with low immune activation despite the fact that these monkeys actually have very high levels of SIV replicating in their body. Now, this is a story that many, uh, many of you may not be aware of, but in Africa, there are over 40 species of primates, non-human primates, and the 40 uh, or more species in Africa each have their own natural SIV. These viruses were arguably the source of the zoonotic jump from chimp into human in the case of HIV-1 or SIV of pseudomangabes in HIV-2 into humans. And in their natural hosts, these viruses, even though the virus is replicating at high level, is not associated with any discernible pathology. But if you take the SIV from an African green monkey, for example, and put it into a rhesus macaque monkey, that monkey will develop an AIDS-like disease and die within one year. So we now, it turns out, even though there are 40 African primates with their own SIVs, only two of them have really been studied in any detail. That's the African green monkey and the pseudomangabe monkeys. And interestingly, again, in those infections in the natural hosts, immune activation is kept under control. It normalizes fairly quickly after initial infection. Whereas in HIV infection in humans or SIV infection in non-natural primate hosts, immune activation goes up. These immune uh, activation and the resistance of the naturally infected monkeys is reflected by this low level of immu chronic immune activation. And essentially what that seems to do is it minimizes the immunopathology, immune responses that drive disease. It keeps the CD4 levels uh, from being totally eliminated. It seems to sustain the mucosal barrier in the monkeys so that they don't have microbial translocation and they preserve uh, their CD4 uh, uh, lymphocyte memory cells as well as the architecture of their lymph nodes. So perhaps with that background, we now have to ask what drives immune activation in HIV infection in people. And the predominant theory is that when the mucosal immune system gets wiped out, there's no effective barrier in our mucous membranes and microbial products like lipopolysaccharide 
and microbial products from bacteria leak from the, the gut, for example, into the circulation of HIV-infected individuals. And these activate the system and drive immune activation. But actually, I'd like to convince you that HIV pathogenesis is way more than a leaky gut. And this brings us to the findings that the Nobel Prize in part was given for, these advances in understanding innate or our very evolutionarily primitive uh, immune defenses. And these, are, these molecules that are on this slide, the toll-like receptors, were actually discovered in fruit flies. Yet when the genes were sequenced, it was found that these genes are highly conserved and they're found in all animal species and even in plants. And basically these molecules, and this is one family, the toll-like receptors, are essentially our body's early warning system of infection. When we get an infection, they rapidly detect highly conserved molecules that are found on bacteria or viruses, but not in the vertebrate host. And the alarm button is triggered to activate innate immunity and responses to try to control these infections. Now, the toll-like receptors are only one family of innate receptors. We're now aware that there are many families of these. I'm not going to review them all for you. But some of the toll receptors are expressed on the surfaces of cells, like TLR6, uh, TLR2, TLR5, uh, TLR4 that sees lipopolysaccharide. And some of these molecules are expressed in vesicles inside of cells, such as TLR3, TLR7, 8, and 9, and some of them float around in the cytoplasm of cells. <clears throat> now, this brings me to Dr. Frank Plummer and colleagues. Keith Folk is the young graduate student standing next to him. Nico Nagelkirk, their statistician and uh, Joe Boyle, who was the head of MedMicro in Nairobi. This was one of my first trips to Africa. I think I, I had gone to, to work with, uh, with Keith as a graduate student to, to show him how to do killer T cell assays. And in Nairobi at this time, the Winnipeg and Nairobi groups were monitoring cohorts of commercial sex workers in the Pumwani slum district and they made a very phenomenal uh, finding. That finding was that, and this was in the early days of HIV and our awareness of it, and basically they monitored these women for seroconversion or infection with HIV. And what they found, since these were commercial sex workers being exposed very highly to HIV, is that over time, many of these women got infected with HIV. But as they monitored the women in the cohort, they found paradoxically that women that had been in sex work for a long period of time actually were surviving and not infected. And instead of going down to baseline, it leveled off. And these women were judged to be highly exposed, seronegative, or HIV-resistant uh, commercial sex workers. And for the very first Gates Grand Challenge grant, Frank Plummer, and met with many colleagues, myself included, prepared uh, a, a large uh, grant, which was one of three Gates grants awarded uh, in Canada, which was to really comprehensively look at the mechanisms of resistance in these highly exposed, uninfected women. My laboratory's task or bit in this undertaking was essentially to look at the role of innate immunity in the protection of these women in the peripheral blood, which I'll start to tell you about uh, now in infection, and then in the genital tract of these women. So is expression of innate immunity and these receptors altered in the peripheral blood of, uh, of these women? Now, 
initially we looked at uh, untreated chronic HIV infected individuals. And what we saw in these individuals was that HIV infection was associated with significantly increased expression of these in, innate pattern recognition receptors or toll-like receptors in the peripheral blood of these women. And TLR 6, 7, and 8 went up dramatically uh, relative to uh, uninfected uh, and uh, relative to uninfected uh, women. And as the time went on and disease progressed, more innate receptors significantly went up in, an, in expression, including TLR2, TLR3, TLR4. And so what we had was a situation that as the disease progressed from a chronic infection to AIDS, there was increasing uh, elevated expression and dysfunction of these uh, toll-like receptors. And in fact, increased expression of TLR6 and 7 their expression was significantly correlated with the HIV viral load in these untreated uh, HIV-infected sex workers. In vitro, if we took single-stranded RNA of HIV, and single-stranded RNA is a ligand for toll-like receptor 7 and 8, and dumped it into cells from non-HIV-infected individuals, it would increase the expression of TLR8. Interesting, uh, it would also increase expression in HIV-infected individuals. But interestingly, uh, uh, this single-stranded RNA also increased expression of TLR4. So it cross-activated TLR4, and TLR4 was already elevated. Uh, in HIV-positive uh, individuals. If we look at TLR4 and LPS stimulation, which LPS binds to TLR4, in uninfected people, we're tolerant to it, so, so it shuts this response off. But it is elevated and is not down-modulated in HIV-infected individuals. This means that sub-endotoxic levels of LPS in the blood are toxic in HIV-infected individuals. And interestingly, exposure to LPS cross-upregulated the expression of TLR8. Um, the increased expression uh, in these pattern recognition receptors, these are actually functional changes because if one looks at cytokine responses to TLR ligands, again, single-stranded RNA or LPS, we see significantly uh, elevated levels of TNF-alpha, which is a cytokine that drives inflammation. Interestingly, when the HIV-infected individuals were put on antiretroviral drugs, the expression of their innate pattern recognition receptors normalized, suggesting that the virus itself was playing a role in driving uh, this phenomenon. And, and the ART was, these changes in TLR expression were independent of CD4 T cell recovery. So from this, we believe that actually this dysfunction of innate sensing in HIV infected individuals is a key driver of immune activation in untreated HIV infected individuals. We're not saying that LPS and leakage of these microbial products doesn't, but it's a two-hit model, and really the driver is this elevated expression of the innate pattern recognition receptors. Now we'll turn to the expression of innate immunity in cervical mononuclear cells and cervical epithelial cells from the HIV-resistant commercial sex workers. And interestingly, uh, what you're seeing in red are the HIV-resistant sex workers. In green, the susceptible, uninfected commercial sex workers. And in black, the HIV-positive commercial sex workers. And what you can see, interestingly, is that there's a significant decrease in the levels of TLR7 and 8 expression in cervical mononuclear cells of the HIV-resistant commercial sex workers. 
And in fact, when we look at other innate receptors and signaling molecules, we see that TLR2, Rig I, and MDA5, which are cytoplasmic innate sensors, are all significantly decreased in the cervical mononuclear cells of these resistant sex workers from their genital tracts. Also, UNC93B, which is a molecule that shuttles the TLR3, 7, 8, and 9 into endosomes, were low, low expressed in the CMCs of the resistant sex workers. And we also observed significantly reduced expression of TLR4, TLR6, TLR8, interferon gamma, and JAK2, which is uh, 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 an adapter molecule involved in the re receptors of uh, interferon. These were also all significantly reduced in expression in the commercial resistant sex workers. When we look at the uh, um, cytokine expressions uh, in response to HIV RNA uh, in these resistant uh, commercial sex workers, what we found is that there are significantly reduced basal levels of cytokine expression uh, in the commercial sex workers. And interestingly, if you dump single-stranded RNA from HIV in with their cells, there is a rapid upregulation uh, in responses to single-stranded uh, RNA. So even though there is, if you will, an immune quiescence in the mononuclear cells of the genital tracts of these resistant sex workers, if HIV uh, PAMPs or uh, signals are put in, the immune system makes a very res rapid response uh, to that. Sorry, I have to look at the slides down on the floor and I don't have a pointer. Now, let's switch from the mononuclear cells, which are cells like macrophages, dendritic cells, T cells, B cells, that are in the genital tract, and these come off in the uh, cervical cytobrushes. And if we now look at cervical epithelial cells, which essentially are the main barrier uh, of the genital tract. Uh, what we found is that expression of selected pattern recognition in the cervical epithelial cells uh, were again decreased in some cases, but there was significantly elevated expression of TLR3 and TLR7 in the resistant uh, sex workers. These are molecules found in the endosome that see uh, double-stranded RNA uh, and RNA from H, uh, si uh, single-stranded RNA from HIV. Also, we observed that NF-kappa B and AP1 were highly expressed and activated in the cervical epithelial cells from the resistant uh, sex workers, and expression of NF-kappa B subunit P65 is increased in the resistant CECs, and phosphorylation of I kappa B and C June are increased in the resistant uh, and positive infected compared to the uh, susceptible. And we believe that this is probably driven by the elevated TLR3 and TLR7 in the cervical epithelial cells. What about the lavage fluid that bathes the genital tracts of these resistant sex workers? Well, interestingly, the pro-inflammatory cytokine levels in the CVL of these sex workers is significantly decreased. So pro-inflammatory cytokines, including interleukin-1, interleukin-8, and RANTES, are all significantly low expressed in the CVL of the resistant sex workers. But another significant finding was made by the Winnipeg group they were looking at CVLs from resistant women, and they identified a biomarker, a molecule in the cervicovaginal fluid that was associated with resistance to HIV infection in these women. And those molecules are trapin-2 and elafin. What are they? 
Well, trapin-2 and olefin are whey acidic proteins. They're serine antiproteases. And essentially, trapin-2 is a bigger precursor molecule, shown in blue. And it gets, uh, excuse me, shown in red uh, in the second uh, line. And it gets proteolytically cleaved into olefin, a smaller piece. And the C terminus of trapin and olefin have antiprotease activity, and the N terminus functions to anchor those molecules in the extracellular matrix. We verified that the levels of trapin 2 olefin were significantly elevated in the cervical vaginal lavage fluid of the resistant sex workers. And in fact, if we took that CVL and put it in vitro with HIV, it was able to significantly uh, reduce the replication of HIV in culture. In order to show that it was the trap and olefin that was actually responsible for this, we used antibodies to pull the trap and olefin out. We were only able to reduce the amounts uh, by approximately 30%. Yet, the, when we reduced, pulled the trapin out, trapin olefin out, the virus replicated 60% better, suggesting that these molecules play a major role in the CVL in directly uh, affecting HIV infection and replication. And in fact, each trapin and olefin uh, have anti-HIV activity. And in fact, it's dependent on the cells that one uses to measure its, uh, its effects. Interestingly, the effects that we see are against the R CCR5 HIVs, the HIVs that initiate HIV infection, rather than against the CXCR4 uh, HIV viruses. And because we're interested in these molecules, we made and or obtained trapin recombinants or olefin recombinants, and some of them had uh, uh, little uh, signals or molecules put on the end or C terminus of these molecules. And what we found is that only the trapin olefin that had an unrestricted end terminus were able to inhibit HIV replication. And it turned out that trapin and olefin, if we ask where are these found in cells, if we dump these molecules on as recombinant molecules, it turns out that only uh, the, that, that these molecules, particularly the uh, trapin and olefin with restricted C terminuses, they can enter the nucleus of cells as well as inhibit RNA. Uh, but exogenous olefin with restricted N terminuses don't enter the nucleus of cells and do not inhibit HIV uh, infection and replication. And it turns out that trapin and olefin are immunomodulatory, that they attenuate NF kappa B activation in HEC 1A cells. Uh, interestingly, trapinolafin, again, it's a bit uh, hard to see, but it inhibits IL-8, which is a pro-inflammatory molecule, and it alters the expression of innate pattern recognition receptors. Uh, and this is particularly done by olefin. So these modulate, down-modulate, or if you will, quiet, the innate sensors in the uh, in the CVL and in the cervical epithelial cells. And it turns out that elafin, if we look for its activity, is about 130 times more potent than trapin in reducing infection of uh, HIV of TZMBL cells, which are cells that have canonical HIV receptors, CD4 and CCR5. It's about 80 times more potent than trapin in reducing HIV transcytosis across hex cells. Uh, so it's a very uh, potent molecule. So in summary, the trapin olefin molecules are among the principal innate anti-HIV molecules in the cervical vaginal fluid of the resistant sex workers. Um, the activity against HIV is contextual, 
uh, and depends on viral strain, HIV receptors, and an unrestricted end terminus of olefin, as well as its ability to enter the nucleus. Um, it reduces HIV-triggered NF-kappa-B translocation and IL-8 secretion and modifies the expression of pattern recognition receptors. To maybe totally conclude this, we now know that immunopathology of un untreated HIV infection reflects progressive innate immune dysfunction, particularly significantly elevated in, uh, sensing and responses that really drive immune activation and promote pathogenesis. In the resistant uh, sex workers, their resistance is a local phenomenon at the mucosal membranes of the genital tract. And it's due in part, again, to altered expression of innate uh, sensors and by molecules in the CVL uh, that alter the innate sensing in the genital tracts. Um, it appears that the endosome-associated TLRs, particularly TLR3 and TLR7, that sense viral RNA uh, are uh, significantly activated to defend against local HIV infection, essentially they probably stop the virus uh, in its tracks before it actually um, is able to initiate infections and obviously suppresses uh, inflammation uh, responses. And understanding innate mucosal immunity is going to be critical to effective control of HIV disease progression and we believe the development of effective mucosal HIV vaccines. And on that note, uh, we just have a model that indicates, again, that in the CVL, there's decreased pro-inflammatory mediators, significantly elevated trap and 2 olefin. In the uh, epithelium itself, there is down modulation of most innate sensors, but significant upregulation of particularly TLR3 and 7. And in the uh, cervical mononuclear cells, for the most part, they're uh, immunologically quiet to keep from triggering, again, profound uh, inflammatory responses in the female genital tract. And I would like to acknowledge a number of people, particularly the people uh, at the University of Nairobi. Dr. Zhao Dan Yao in my lab is the uh, woman with the red circle around her face. And I would like to acknowledge our collaborators from the University of Manitoba, particularly uh, Rich Lester and Wari Omang and, and Blake Ball, who essentially uh, played key roles in this work. Our colleagues at U of Nairobi, Walter uh, and Charles Washini, uh, um, all the clinical and lab staff uh, in Nairobi, as well as the Pumwani uh, women participants. And in my laboratory, Dr. Yao and Bethany uh, Henricks have played uh, important roles in going to Africa and collecting the specimens. And uh, Dr. Anna Dronik and Kakon Nag uh, spent a lot of time working on the trap and two olefin uh, mechanisms. Uh, and I, on that, I thank you all for your attention. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks very much. Can I get to give you a little gift and get your picture? You get your picture taken with me. Oh, okay. good. <laughs> yeah. Oh, hang on, bring it. Yeah. So here you go. Here's the gift. There you go. Thank you. And uh, from Carr, it's a great honor to be able to present you with the the uh, trophy you. for the lecture. I think we get our picture taken. I get a hold on. All right, can I take a, take a water? Yeah, you hold that. I'll hold the water. You hold everything. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Good. Thank you. Thanks, Ken. Thanks, so no questions. Uh oh. No, no. Do you want to take a Okay, so my last duty up here is to introduce Bill Cameron the past president of CAR, and he will introduce the um, Red Ribbon awardee. Well, thank you, Mr. President. I prefer to be introduced as your ex-president for life. 
not passed. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm here to introduce someone uh, and acknowledge a professional lifetime of contribution by someone who is not gone, not forgotten, uh, still with us, Professor Peter Michael Ford, uh, who I met first in the 1970s at Queen's University as a teacher and a professor of medicine in immunology and rheumatology who worked there with his wife Sally teaching medical students um, and uh, uh, has accomplished uh, another form of contribution to HIV and AIDS in his professional lifetime that uh, Carr has decided to acknowledge and thank. Uh, there are many ways to contribute. Uh, Dr. Ford contributed particularly in HIV from about 1983 uh, when he began to work in the care of people uh, who are incarcerated in prisons, federal prisons. Uh, there's more than a few of those around Queen's University in Kingston. Uh, Peter Ford is a graduate of London University, currently an emeritus professor at Queen's University, former director of the HIV clinic in Kingston General Hospital who took up that task uh, from a very short line of candidates who were willing to do so. He provided care to HIV-positive prisoners in federal prisons since the mid-1980s. And I would like to remind us that that's something about 30 years ago. This is a lifetime of quiet contribution, of help, and of um, not promoted, not advertised, but well-spoken contribution to a cause that he stuck to for longer than 20 years in doing this work. He carried out studies of HIV and later hepatitis C prevalence in prisons and associated it with risk behaviors within our prisons. Uh, he's currently providing HIV care to all federal prisons in Ontario by telemedicine, a new technology that I'm not familiar with yet. And he's doing so from a peaceful retirement on Manitoulin Island, from where he's been called to accept our congratulations and thanks for a lifetime of contribution in HIV care in an area which has been unsung, but deeply, for which we are deeply grateful. And Dr. Ford, if you could come up be thanked and congratulated. I'd like to. Uh, Dr. Ford will be uh, moderating and uh, leading a discussion on Sunday about these issues which are close to his heart, close to his professional career and contribution, and I'd like to remind us to attend and learn from a master of the actual problem who works close to the ground. There are many ways to contribute, and his way is one that's, I think, uh, an example for us. Thank you very much, Bill, for the kind words. <clears throat> I'd just like to say that I'm very cognizant of the honor bestowed upon me with this award, and also surprised because uh, prison medicine, prison infectious diseases have had a very low profile over the years, uh, which I hope to raise for you on the plenary session on Sunday morning. So I hope to see all of you there. Thank you. So thank you to all the speakers.